Mr Howard, ladies and gentlemen, friends. My task is to set the scene ahead of this fourth Howard Government Retrospective Conference. As Harvey mentioned, this is the last in this series, but people have enjoyed it so much, I thought, why not just throw one more in? I'll talk about that a little bit later. So there will be one more. The aim, though, in the retrospectives to date has been to examine the four Howard governments and to use the benefit of hindsight to propose an agenda for researchers over the next decade as the Cabinet papers and other official documents become available. It's hard to write good history without the raw materials. And that raw material certainly are the documents which are even now becoming available. In one sense, because we have the wreath diaries, we already know what happened in Cabinet. But that'll just be our secret here and to the thousands of people who watch this on Sky News Extra. But each of the conferences has produced a substantial collaborative volume and we proudly launched the third today. In the first conference, it opened with the 1996 election and the foundational year of coalition rule, focusing on the campaign and the results, budget repair and the imposition of financial discipline and, of course, the National Firearms Agreement. The second conference began with the Workplace Relations Act, enacted in January of 1997. It covered difficulties arising from the Ministerial Code of Conduct and the challenge of introducing a new tax system. The tax system that would never, ever, it's dead, be implemented was, in fact, like the author, someone a little like Lazarus, uh, having a new life. And the new tax system, of course, was unveiled in outline in 1998. The second conference ended with the Ashton by-election of the 14th of July 2001, which produced an unexpected coalition victory. The third conference last year looked closely at the tumultuous events of August-October 2001, featuring the collapse of ANSET Airlines, the September 11 terrorist attacks, and the subsequent invasion of Afghanistan. Just to make things more colourful, there was also the MV Tampa controversy and the Children Overboard Affair. This fourth conference commences with the September-October 2004 election campaign. It continues with the coalition unexpectedly gaining control of the Senate. It considers the controversy accompanying work choices there's also the Northern Territory intervention, and we end with an assessment of the coalition's heavy defeat in November of 2007, and we touch on some of the Howard government's enduring legacies. This is the only conference of the four which features two elections. Now, when the coalition won a landslide victory, and indeed it was a landslide, the second biggest parliamentary majority in Australian history, on the 2nd of March 1996, commentators believed it would very likely govern for two terms, given the extent of its majority and the unpopularity of Labor at the end of the Hawke-Keating years. After having its majority slashed at the 1998 election and coming perilously close to defeat, winning the most number of seats but not securing the most number of votes, the same commentators expected the Howard government to be swept from office in 2001. Indeed, polling in 2000 and in early 2001 showed consistently that the Labor opposition led by Kim Beazley was on track for a comfortable victory, not unlike more recent attitudes. After the May 2001 budget, the mood in the electorate began to change. By November of 2001, when the election was held, the government was returned to office and actually increased its majority. The 2001 election was, as we all recall, highly significant because it was so thoroughly controversial. And accounts of the result continue to reflect vigorous disagreement. Now, after Simon Crean succeeded Kim Beazley as leader of the opposition, Labor's continuing inability to reduce the government's supremacy in the polls led Crean to stand down, 
with the Labor caucus making the courageous decision to elect Mark Latham in his place. From his ascendance in December 2003, Labor, rather Latham, fascinated commentators with a political style that could be traced back to the firebrand premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang, via the Placido Domingo of Australian politics, Paul Keating. And when asked in 2002 about his political outlook, Latham revealed, I'm a hater. Part of the tribalness of politics is really dislike for the other side with intensity. And the more I see of them, the more I hate them. I hate their negativity. I hate their narrowness. I hate the way, for instance, John Howard tries to appeal to suburban values when I know he hasn't got any real answers to the problems and challenges we face. I hate the phoniness of that. None of us were left wondering. <laughs> Latham was big and bold, intense and impulsive. He was also young and exuberant with boundless energy compensating for limited experience. Those who had been drawn to the coalition by John Howard's earthly suburban outlook were enticed back to Labor by Latham's down-to-earth demeanor. He started town hall style meetings across the country, campaigned on the primacy of values, talked about the ladder of opportunity, and promoted the slogan, ease the squeeze, to emphasise the struggles being faced by families. Now, we need to remember the electorate initially liked him, if not loved him. And by March of 2004, Latham enjoyed a higher personal approval rating than any other opposition leader since Bob Hawke's brief tenure of one month in that post in February of 1983, before then he became Prime Minister. The outsider, as he was described by some, might yet become Prime Minister by the year's end, despite the coalition managing a strong and growing economy and exerting firm leadership in the global war on terror. Now, of John Howard's political opponents over the previous decade, Keating, Beasley and Crean, Latham was clearly the maverick and the one who appeared most threatening with his utter unpredictability. For instance, on the 10th of February 2004, he wrong-footed the government on superannuation entitlements for federal politicians, a matter that was mentioned periodically in the parliament but largely overlooked by the press and the people. Latham announced that a Labor government would close the existing scheme. Latham claimed the provisions of the scheme are well outside the community standard in Australia and have become out of date. They offer superannuation benefits seven times more generous than the current contribution scheme available to the general public. Parliamentary superannuation has become a major source of public dissatisfaction and cynicism in modern politics. This is why a Labor government will pass legislation closing the scheme to new entrants. Two days later, Prime Minister Howard said the government would close the existing scheme and establish less generous superannuation arrangements for new members and senators who entered parliament after the coming federal election. John Howard justified his hasty decision on the basis of, and let me quote, a community perception that this super is too generous. I think the overall package is not too generous, but people think the super is generous. And rather than this thing drifting on for months as the subject of partisan political debate, I've decided to act immediately to get it off the agenda as a partisan political issue so that we can have a focus on issues that are really important to the future of this country, such as the free trade agreement with the United States. Now, as we look back on that, it really was an impressive political achievement on Latham's part, shoehorning the coalition into an action that it had not contemplated and which it did not condone. 
Commentators claim that Latham was now setting the agenda with new perspectives and fresh energy. Now, while health and education were always Labor's strong points, Latham knew where he wanted to place the emphasis of policy and the investment of resources. So he championed the introduction of parenting classes for those who were, falling, who were failing to discipline their children adequately. He proposed a nationwide ban on junk food advertising during children's television hours. He advocated substantial investment in early childhood literacy and providing free storybooks. He foreshadowed banning single-use shopping bags across Australia and supported extending the Commonwealth's vilification laws. The Labor leader never lacked for ideas and initiatives, and they, in the main, seem to resonate with the practical challenges being faced in the key metropolitan fringe electorates that Labor hoped to secure, obviously like his own of Werriwa. Latham was personally less committed and politically less convincing when it came to showing leadership in the external portfolios of international trade, foreign affairs and national defence. In fact, he started badly, and in my view, he never really recovered. In March 2004, a year after the invasion of Iraq had failed to uncover any weapons of mass destruction, Labor, Latham sparked controversy by committing a Labor government to withdrawing Australian troops from the Middle East by Christmas 2004. The Prime Minister accused Latham of a cut and run approach and remarked, it's not the Australian way not to stay the distance. Now, the polls showed that Labor lost support over Latham's stance. Support, though, which rebounded after the Abu Ghraib detainee abuse scandal made world headlines. But Latham's confrontational style left little room for diplomacy. In 2003, he claimed George Bush was, and I quote, the most incompetent and dangerous American president in living memory. When Bush described Latham's pullout policy as disastrous and implied Labor should, be, should not be re-elected, that should not be elected, Latham told Bush and his administration to stay out of Australian domestic politics. Really, it was quite messy on all sides. Anti-American sentiment within Labor looked certain to deepen when Latham announced that Peter Garrett, the lead singer of the rock band Midnight Oil and former Senate candidate for the Nuclear Disarmament Party, would be Labor's candidate for the safe Sydney seat of Kingsmith Smith at the next election. Of course, Garrett had co-written the band's strident anti-American anthems, short memory, US forces, and the power and the passion. Garrett had not previously been a member of the Labor Party and seemed a much better fit for the Greens. He was, however, key to Latham's strategy to parade Labor's environmental credentials, particularly in Tasmania, where he seemed indifferent, indifferent, to the fate of timber workers, whose jobs John Howard seemed more committed to preserving. Now, for its part, the third Howard government, in my estimation, was focused predominantly on international affairs. Hosting the Chogham Conference in March 2002, the continuing global war on terror with Australian forces deployed to Afghanistan from November of 2001, dealing with grief following the Bali bombings in October of 2002, continuing whole of government commitments in Bougainville, East Timor, and from July of 2003, the Solomon Islands, the hugely controversial invasion of Iraq in March of 2003, a, nat a massive natural gas agreement with China and free trade agreements with Singapore and Thailand. In my estimation of the four Howard governments, the third from 2001 to 2004 was most preoccupied with international affairs. At home, and it could focus overseas because of what was happening at home, the Treasurer continued to deliver budget surpluses with net government debt on target to be repaid by 2006-07, which it was. National productivity increased and this fed strong economic growth. 
unemployment continued to fall from 8.1% at the start of coalition rule and was heading towards 4.1%, in other words, nearly halved, which would be achieved in 2007. Average weekly earnings grew substantially in real terms, although household debt in relation to disposable income rose considerably. Interest rates were at an acceptable level. Inflation was low, but housing affordability was becoming a problem. Not that the government was to blame, although it usually attracts blame for something beyond its control. Australians generally, though, thought they were doing well, although comparable nations were arguably doing just as well. Could then the Labor opposition be trusted to keep the good times going? This was the key consideration in 2004. So from his incredibly high approval rating in March 2004, Latham inevitably lost some of that support over the coming months. By August, there were rumours that John Howard would call a slightly early election, although by mid-August, three opinion polls showed that Labor was again in front. On the 16th of August, the children overboard affair was revived after a former senior advisor to the, the then Defence Minister, Peter Reith, claimed publicly that he had told the Prime Minister three days before the 2001 election that reports of children being over, thrown overboard from Civ 4 were wrong, only, according to Latham, to have Howard repeat the lie the next day. Labor sought to exploit the lingering controversy with convening a one-day Senate inquiry in the hope of damaging the Prime Minister's credibility. This was high-stakes politics. On the 29th of August, the Prime Minister asked the Governor-General to issue writs for an election to be held on the 9th of October for both Houses of Parliament. He told the assembled media, this election, ladies and gentlemen, will be about trust. Who do you trust to keep the economy strong and protect family living standards? Who do you trust to keep interest rates low? Who do you trust to lead the fight on Australia's behalf against international terrorism? Now, at the campaign launch on the 26th of September 2004, the coalition promised tax breaks for small business, extra funds for government and non-government schools, childcare and stay-at-home parent support, and a boost to formal technical training. And in what proved a turning point in the campaign, John Howard told Tasmanian timber workers gathered in Launceston on the 7th of October 2004 that a re-elected coalition government would, and I quote, preserve an extra 170,000 hectares of Tasmanian old growth forest while ensuring no job losses. The proposed preservation area was condemned by Latham, the Greens and the Democrats, but applauded by the audience of 1,500 timber workers led by the Labor member Dick Adams and by, of all people, the CFMEU led by Michael O'Connor. In response, though, Latham said Labor was offering a plan that would make Australia stronger, fairer and safer, whereas he claimed John Howard's only plan was retirement at the next election. Launching the Labor Party's election campaign on the 29th of September 2004, Latham spoke of the urgent need for an Australian Labor government. Unless we change now, it will be too late to save Medicare, too late to increase bulk billing and improve our public hospital system. Unless we change now, it will be too late for the families who are under financial pressure, too late to solve the family debt crisis and deliver tax relief for all Australian taxpayers. Unless we change now, it will be too late for the security and safety of our nation too late to shift policy and resources to our part of the world, getting it right in Asia in the fight against terror. And unless we change now, it will be too late for the basic decency and honesty of government in this country, too late to restore truth in government 
and end the deceit and buck passing of the Howard years. Now, on the morning before the election, Howard and Latham crossed paths at the ABC Sydney studios. A film crew recorded the encounter, with the opposition leader appearing to drag the Prime Minister towards him with an aggressive twist of the hand. This was, this is, the defining dramatic image of the entire campaign. Even the media said Latham's conduct was aggressive, bullying and intimidating. The Liberal Party's campaign director, Brian Lochnane, later told a gathering here at the National Press Club that this one incident generated more feedback than anything else during the previous six weeks and that it, and I quote him, brought together all the doubts and hesitations that people had about Mark Latham. But the Labor campaign had started to unravel long before that infamous handshake. So to assess both the campaign and the outcome, please welcome our first speaker, Emeritus Professor Murray Goote. 